Of course, some of you I've met before. Some are old friends, others, new friends, acquaintances. Today, we begin the vigil for the Feast of Pentecost, which means the 50 days. 50 days of the celebration of Christ's resurrection. A little over, a little under two weeks ago, on the Feast of the Ascension, we heard how the disciples, before our Lord's ascension into Jerusalem, were told to stay in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from on high. And during that time, during the time of the resurrection, and during the time after the ascension, the disciples turned to the scriptures to understand exactly who Jesus Christ is. They returned to understand how the one who was prophesied in the Old Testament had come, had been in their midst, had suffered according to the scriptures, died, rose again from the dead, and from their midst ascended into heaven. And so they gathered together as a community of faith, believing the word of the Lord, and united together by their common bond of faith. And it is in today's feast of the descent of the Holy Spirit, a feast in which the Lord turns everything upside down, that they are given the power to go forth. Last Sunday, you heard in the Holy Gospel how our Lord Jesus Christ said uh, that they may be one Father, even as I and uh, thou art one. So we know that the Son and the Father are to be honored with the same worship and glory. And today, in the Feast of the Holy Trinity, our Lord reveals himself as also the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is sent down into our midst. And so we add, we clarify this teaching of the consubstantiality of the Father and the Son, that as the Father is God, the Son is God, with the Holy Spirit revealing himself as the Divine Spirit. And so we call this Sunday Trinity Sunday, where the worship of the Trinity is manifest by the descent of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes upon the church, first of all, to unite them together. For our Lord Jesus Christ is no longer physically in their midst, having ascended, he sends the Comforter to console them, but also to unite them as one body, called by his word, called obedience to his word. And if you, if any of you, remember to read the, uh, the uh, appointed passage from the Acts of the Apostles today, you would have heard these words. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And so today on this feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. So, and what do we what do we know of this feast? Is that everyone heard the salvation of God proclaimed in their own tongue. That is, they heard the message of salvation to each and every one. No longer is the property of one ethnic group or people, one tribe warring against other tribes, but salvation for all mankind throughout the whole world. And so the promise of God, made before the ascension, comes to the disciples to console them, to be with them, to abide in their midst, as we will continue here in these next few days, to bring this message of salvation to all nations, that is, the Gentiles, the word the Jews used for everyone other than themselves. And so, here today, we are gathered as the church. We're gathered here to celebrate the descent of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps today all you experience is the descent of this heat and humidity, <laughs> but we celebrate the descent of the Holy Spirit upon us to reveal the church. Here in this icon, for example, you have the 12 apostles gathered as around a table, no longer as the table of the mystical supper, but a table still symbolizing the upper room with the power of God descending upon them in the form of tongues of fire, a shape. That's how they described it. That's how it was revealed to them. And what did this do to them? It filled them with boldness so they would not fear. Now, first of all, the gospel is the absence of fear. Absence of the fear of men, present with the fear of God. To, to empower them. 
first with faith, that is, with conviction that all that God had promised them is true. That what they saw with their eyes, the one they touched with their hands, the one, as we heard in, today, in tonight's gospel reading, who came to them showing the wounds, the marks in his hands and his feet, so they would clearly know it is the Christ, the crucified one, who had risen from the dead. So the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles, and the Spirit comes in like a, a rushing, mighty wind. Again, that's what they describe. That's how it seemed to them. Whether there was an actual wind or not is irrelevant. Or whether you need wind to signify the presence of the Holy Spirit. The word in Hebrew, of course, wind and spirit and breath are all uh, um, connected. And so the apostles are given the power to go forth fearlessly, unarmed, against the armed Roman world, the world of armor, the world of walls, the world of barriers, the world of taxation, the world of rules, to go forth into that world and turn it upside down so that what seems light is actually darkness. What seems death becomes life. What seems to be power is shown to be weakness, and what men esteem as weakness becomes strength. And so the powerless fishermen, the uneducated fishermen, become stronger and wiser than philosophers. They show philosophers to be fools and unlearned. And they show themselves as the ones who open the keys to not only the scriptures, but also all the oracles of the pagan world. A few days ago, we yesterday, we commemorated Saint Justin the philosopher. One who, they call him the philosopher, because he was one who studied philosophy and turned to Christ, but he kept the attribute of the philosopher, that is the philosopher's robe, so that those who were who esteemed philosophers would pay attention to his words to proclaim the gospel to them. So that was like this net. And here you see this table now, as in the shape of a net. And so in the hymn we sang, Blessed art thou, O Christ our God, who has made the fishermen most wise. What do fishermen use? They use nets. What do they catch? Fish. Our Lord Jesus Christ promised them they would be what? Fishers of men. So they go forth with this image of a net to draw the world into the nets. For whom? For our Lord Jesus Christ. This is this great catch of fish which our Lord Jesus Christ typified after he appeared to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. But these are great fish. These are logical fish or fish of the word. And so today we celebrate this great feast characterized by the descent of the Holy Spirit, characterized also, you see these branches. These are not just tree huggers here. <laughs> the greenery expresses the newness of life, which comes forth after winter, which is the flowering of the human person by the power of God within us. And so Christians grow through the power of the Holy Spirit coming into their lives. Last week's feast is the feast of the fathers of the First Council, who proclaimed the Father and the Son to be one in essence, and this Sunday we proclaim the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one in essence. As you heard in the hymns, the Father is light, the Son is light, and the Holy Spirit is light. They come to lighten the world. Light meaning the opposite of ignorance, or the darkness as the absence of knowledge. Light being the presence of knowledge, the Son of God. And so it is as one's enlightened one's filled with the knowledge of Christ, that is how our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is known through the scriptures, the scriptures here meaning the Old Testament, that in reading the Old Testament, a Christian sees Christ. So as one's enlightened, we become confessors of Christ. And so we are gathered together by the Holy Spirit for this task, each of us, each of us, to proclaim our Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, to bring this faith that is a faith which was once the property or the inheritance of one tribe to the whole world to give hope, to give hope to a world that has no hope, to give joy to a world which is in conflict. So we become the bearers of this message of hope throughout the whole world in our lives. Whether you say a single word or not, whether you ever tell somebody you're a Christian, they should be able to see it in your lives by the way you act, by the way you treat your children, by the way you honor one another. Somebody will not want to ask you, 
why are you different? Says, well, I'm kind of a, mm, a clumsy person, but I love God and He loves me. And if, if we can do that, we can allow someone else to have that same treasure that we have. We can share what is precious to us in our lives. And so it's not the louder you speak. It's the way that you live in a more godly and loving way that actually makes a difference. It'll change the life of your neighbor and give him or her something for which they're longing. So those who are lonely are included and no longer lonely. Those who are, whose lives are broken, that their lives can be healed by the power of God working through you and you and you and you. Through all of us. So let us give thanks to God whose goodwill it is to dwell in our midst, to unite us one to another as the one flock of Christ. <clears throat> Lord Jesus.